I started really by accident, but I, I've known Dennis Brunson for years, and Dennis has always been talking about it. I was lucky enough to know Muriel Arbour as well, who came to Lyme probably, I think it was nearly 50 years, only broken by the war, and her interest with the landslide. She, she wrote about this um, back in the 50s and 60s. And it is one of the most famous landslides in the world. Happened on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 1839 and made famous by the fact that William Conybeare, vicar of Axmouth and William Buckland, who was then the vicar of uh, Axminster, they produced a paper along with illustrations by uh, Mary Buckland and the surveyor William Dawson, who was based in Exeter. And they produced what was only then the second ever scientific account of a landslide with this wonderfully long Victorian title 10 plates um, consisting of planned sections and views representing the changes produced on the coast of East Devon between Axmouth and Lyme Regis by the subsidence of the land and the elevation of the bottom of the sea. Fabulous, fabulous long title. Um, and since then, lots of people have had a go at it, but um, struggled to be quite honest. We don't have a modern map or model to explain it until now, perhaps. Um, John, I'm just want to be assured, are you all still there? Yes, I hope so. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> yeah, so where are we? It's very weird doing this without an audience. Where are we? We're, we're in, in the undercliff between Lyme Regis and Axmouth, um, actually more towards the Seton or Axmouth side. That's Bindon there, Great Bindon landslide, um, just here. So about four miles from Lyme and two miles from, from Seton. And from the air, um, this is a little drone flight taken with Natural England. There's the cliff edge. This is Goat Island. And basically there's the chasm. The chasm's the thing that really has got people's imagination. How did the land subside? The Coast Guards were apparently on the cliff top at Christmas day evening, and they just watched the land subside in front of them under the moonlight. Sorry, That's Richard, can I just phenomenal. stop you there? Are you, are you sharing your screen at the moment? Yes, I am. I can only see, we can only see you. Okay. Um, have you, has that been the case all along? Uh, sorry, yes, I've only just realised that that's, uh, that um, we were supposed to be looking at images. Right, interesting. Um, okay, let me go back into, into Zoom. Let's try that again. There we go. Yeah. That's better, thank you. Okay. Um, well, yeah, so uh, that slide, this will do. So we're in, uh, let me go Let me go back one. Yeah, so where we are, we're between Axmouth and Lyme Regis in the undercliffs just there, uh, more towards the Seton side of things. So from the from the cliff, yeah, there's the cliff top, there's Goat Island, here's the chasm, which as I say is, is really mystifying. And what happened basically is that Goat Island slipped seaward and the ground behind subsided to, uh, to create this enormous chasm. And it's, it's, well, we'll talk about it more in a minute. And from the other direction, looking back towards the west, luckily now, Natural England and the southwest coast path have been able to divert the path right across Goat Island. So you can actually um, get a real sense of, of a lot of it. Great advance. But here is one of the illustrations by uh, Mary Buckland looking east with golden cap in the background. And you can see this enormous great big area of land that subsided with a rift behind it. And then here's Goat Island off to the right there. Early attempts at time-lapse photography, I think, with Buckland and Conybeare avidly discussing what may or may or not have gone on. Um, early photograph by Charles Grover, very, very useful because photographs don't tell lies, as we all know. And you can see just how complicated things are. Here, here's a pinnacle of rock with the original land surface. There's another pinnacle of rock with no land surface. This one, there's the land surface, back, back tilted and pipe, lines of rows of pinnacles and pikes. 
very, very complicated picture. And our big problem today is that it's all overgrown. It's overgrown. It's the largest self-sown ash woodland in Britain. Um, ash dieback may make a change to that, but I think it'll make it an awful lot worse in the short term. Um, so those old photographs are really, really useful. Again, another illustration looking towards the west this time with beer head in the background. Um, looks a little different from the previous one. Again, that's the, the risk of illustration. And the closest I can find in Lyme Museum's archive of photographs of a similar sort of view looking uh, west towards the chasm. And that, these photographs, are, as you'll see later, become really useful. And then on the beach, the, the other thing I think that really caught people's imagination was that the seabed was heaved up by 40 feet out of the water. And in fact, people even considered that this might become a harbour at some stage. Queen Victoria famously came and viewed it from the coast. And of course, the Victorians loved natural spectacle. And, um, and Coombe Pine on the railway line became known as Coombe Pine for the landslide. And there's this lovely account of a gentleman from Honiton who, upon sighting the landslide, was so overwhelmed, he had to be taken back to his sickbed and was only recovered with some great difficulty. I mean, it must have been an absolutely extraordinary sight. And again, another view. Buckland and Coney Beer pontificating about uh, the nature of the landslide there. So William Dawson, he was a surveyor. Um, 1839, we're talking, 1840, he realised the importance of the need to produce a map, but he also recognised that sort of orthographic view would really help as well. And it's quite an extraordinary feat, I would say. And he also produced a whole series of cross sections through the chasm. But the only one he produced through the whole landslide was down here, sort of through the very eastern edge of um, of Goat Island itself. And that's then the section or a section that Conebeer used in his paper to try and explain what may have happened. And he basically felt that the softer elements of the green sand, which we'll come across a little bit later on, sort of squidged out of the sides, allowing the ground to subside as it moved seaward in what we would call today as a translational landslide, moving on a, a flat shear surface or a, a single shear surface. But there are all sorts of um, things, challenges with that. The, the, the layers, the strata are all over the place. The difference between those beds and the underlying beds are all mixed up. And the geometry of the chasm block at the back there just doesn't look like it could possibly fit. I mean, in fairness to them, this, this was, you know, the first time anyone had ever tried to do this, to try to actually see inside the landscape. But so obviously over the years, it led to different ideas. One is that it's a circular failure, a rotational landslide with a large curved surface. But rotational landslides typically rotate the blocks. And these, you can see here, are not really rotated according to Buckland. So or that it was on a deeper shear surface that again is related to the to the bedding. But as I started looking at this, um, I realized there's an even more sort of fundamental problem. Um, so this this section was drawn on the 17th of March by Dawson. And he's got here the edge, the, the hedge forming the eastern boundary of Great Bindon. And then on the back of Goat Island, the continuation of that hedge. So if we go and look at Dawson's map, that's that section there. And then he only drew this one section through the whole landslide there. And a lot of people have assumed that this section is a line straight through the middle of Goat Island when it actually isn't. And the significance of that will come in later because there are two landslides here. Um, and then I puzzle where actually is Coney Beer's section? There's, there it is drawn. If you try and put it onto his map, you can see that Goat Island on the map is less than half of the thickness of Goat Island on the section. Where is it? Does it run down through here? It can't fit there. Does it fit through here? It doesn't seem to fit anywhere. 
And I think it's a composite. Um, it, he's mixed two things together. As they moved forward with the work on the landslide, they realized the relationship of the different elements. And so he came back in, in March and I think did a quick survey of the middle bit to make a composite picture. I don't know for sure, but I think so. But it's caught a lot of people out because it's a bit like taking one of these and then doing, doing that to it. And then asking yourself, how many engines has it got? How many seats? And that classic question, how many planes would it take to cover an area the size of Wales? And of course you can't do it because the information is incorrect from the start. And then we had John Pitts back in the 1980s. He spent six or seven years mapping the entire undercliff with a machete, a theodolite and a packet of John Player specials because they feature on all of his pictures for scale. And we can see that there is a big arcuate landslide called Dowlands. Well, I'm calling it Dowlands because it is in Dowlands. And next to it is Goat Island and the chasm. And then in front of Goat Island is a smaller, older landslide. And to the west side is another landslide that has been active more recently. Um, the historic accounts are really useful because uh, we have Critchard, who was coming back from Bindon Manor, having celebrated Christmas Eve, a drunken party, and they stumbled over cracks east of the cape-like projection of the upper range, which would become the scene of the next and greatest convulsion. And this not, did not show itself until the following day. So there are Dowland's cottages. This is where they were walking. They were walking back down here. They encountered cracks and, and whatever here. So the movement started here in Dowlands and came back a day later. So there, there are the Dowlands cottages. The pre-existing Dowlands landslide failed first on the evening of Christmas Eve, 1839. And then by Christmas Day evening, it had unloaded the weight of this mass here and allowed Bindon to come out pushing up the reef in front of Dowlands, not in front of Goat Island. So that starts to make a lot more sense, I think. And then a few little bits of detail. This is the north side of Goat Island, looking back into the chasm. You can see these blocks here on the side, and you can see how they've come from, from there. They've slipped back down into the chasm. And in fact, this is the very northeastern corner of Goat Island, a really spectacular spot with ravines. And this block here, you can see, has actually come from there. But that's north. So the back of Goat Island is actually sliding into the chasm, which I don't think many people have appreciated before. That previous picture was just there. And so when we look at this whole corner of Goat Island here, you can actually see that there's the shear surface there. And all of this block or these blocks have slipped back into the chasm. If you imagine Goat Island splitting apart, you're forming a vertical cliff both north and south and both want to fail and both will fail. But the trouble is you get much further on in there and you, you basically need bare grills with you because it becomes impenetrable, absolutely overgrown, broken, jumbled, very difficult ground. And then in Dowlands, there are these very prominent high ridges. This one's called Cat Ridge, and it's enormous. The, the drop on the southern side is about 20 metres, and the drop on the north side is about 10 metres, maybe a bit more. Very prominent, big ledges, ridges running through. Now, landslides happen because we have Cretaceous rocks, the chalk and the greensand lying above impermeable Jurassic or Triassic rocks. And the rainwater can soak through the chalk and the sandstone, but it can't sink through the clay. So it flows out along the junction and lubricates that junction and allows great big chunks of blocks to slide and push down onto the beach. And most of our landslides um, are translational, which means they happen on this planar surface based on the stratigraphy, the layers of rock. And most are on the unconformity, which I'll explain a bit more about in a minute. And it's a lovely simple diagram until you um, do this. You put the blocks back and, oh, hang on a second, they don't fit. 
and there are lots and lots of landslide sections and illustrations, even in scientific papers, where basically people have drawn what they think is there based on what you can see at the surface. But actually, the underlying structure is much more complicated, as I hope I will be able to demonstrate later. So look, you can see the geometry is all wrong. And what's missing are these V-shaped wedges. Um, but the other thing is that landslides happen on other layers in the Jurassic. So this is just to the east of Lyme Regis, Church Cliffs, uh, March 2008, May the 6th, 2008. That happened in about 20 minutes. 300 meters of the cliff collapsed in about 20 minutes. And that's because there is a weak surface lying here at the top of the blue lias, the banded lower Jurassic rocks. And when we step back and look at Lyme Regis, we actually can see that there are weak layers forming the terraces in the cliff that run through the town as well. And that's why 60 million pounds has been spent on coastal engineering around Lyme Regis to try and stop the erosion. And it's based on really good work between geotechnical engineers, geomorphologists, people who study landslides and geologists. Very, very good partnership. But th those shears extend to the other side of line. So this is Seven Rock Point beyond Monmouth Beach. And look, there's a shear surface where all of this has collapsed in the past. And above it, just there, is another shear surface. So one of the big questions is, um, where, did land, where did Dowlands fail? So we have to do the geology now. Uh, Pinhay Bay, my favorite spot, mostly because you really don't see anyone down there or very few people. On the top of the cliff is the chalk and the green sand from the Cretaceous age. The gray cliffs are the Jurassic, lower Jurassic. And below that is the white lias, which is actually Triassic in age. And then underneath the beach are the red Mercia mudstones that you see at Seton. So that's the geology. And the real question, oh, and what happened here is that all of these rocks were laid down in a sedimentary basin over 200 million years ago. Uh, then they were tilted by earth movements about 100 million years ago, and erosion cut through the layers before the sea returned to lay the sandstone, the green sand, which is composed of two units and the chalk. And the, the junction in between is known as an angular unconformity. So that's the, the main shear surface because these rocks are permeable, these rocks tend to be impermeable. But um, and so when, you, when you're at Lyme Regis, that's why you can see the Cretaceous, the Jurassic and the Triassic at Pinhay Bay. Whereas when you get to Haven Cliff just east of Axmouth, the Jurassic's gone. It's been eroded away. And Bindon and Dowland sit in this absolutely unique position on the coast where the, uh, it's, they straddle this contact between the Triassic and the Jurassic rocks. But it's these Jurassic rocks that have weak surfaces in them, which are the ones that are affecting Lyme Regis. Um, to, for those of you who struggle on that side, here's a geo geographical view. There's Pinhay with the Cretaceous, the Jurassic and the Triassic. And there's, there it sits on that cross section. And there's Haven Cliff with just the Triassic and the Cretaceous because it sits over here on where this, the rocks, the Jurassic have been eroded away. So, um, and down, down as the Bidland sits, sits right there, this unique position on the coast. So the question is, where is the failure surface? Is it on the unconformity or could it be lower down as uh, several very prominent people have suggested? And there are many more as well who've come up with variations of that too. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but I got into this because there's another landslide uh, just to the east of Bindon and Dowlands called the Plateau. And the foreshore here, I've noticed for years, is intriguing because the Jurassic rocks are completely caught up with the big landslide blocks. Um, this is all shales would be quite high up in the Jurassic. And um, they're all back tilted with the blocks and messed up. Tom there is standing on a on a block that's completely different from the others. A little bit further around the corner, this is the very base of the blue lias, 
and it is absolutely mashed, including a melange through here where the rocks have been mashed. And just next door, this is the white lias. Sadie the dog is sitting or standing on the white lias, and this is the blue lias next to it. Now, some people have said this is a fault, but this is fresh. Faults are full of mineralization, calcite crystal and so on. This is all fresh. The landslide, the plateau landslide is moving on one of those shear surfaces in the lias. And to get a handle on that, we, we took a, a, a drone survey with funding from Natural England and photographed at really high resolution the whole of the plateau foreshore. And Natural England liked it so much, we extended it to Dowlands. And that's how I ended up getting in the misfortune of spending three years of my life trying to explain this landslide. Um, and it's really interesting down there. The, the, on the foreshore, there are these huge shear surfaces running through the, uh, the wave cut platform. And the uh, Cretaceous rocks are literally stepped against each other. There's at least 10 meters displacement between those two rocks. And when you actually come down to a physical model to explain how that happens, it starts to get really difficult. But the first thing to do is a map. And uh, this photo montage enabled me to, to map things down to the sort of size of a tennis ball uh, there across two kilometers ashore. Kept me out of the office for months, which was great, of course. And the final result was a few lines on a map, some solid, some dotted. Um, so the previous pictures were there. But what it also enabled me to do was to identify the tow heave that um, William Dawson had on his map. And it is actually there. That same, this curving feature that he's got is, is that this big mound here is that big mound of chert there. I'm certain of it, absolutely certain. And then the next thing, I started looking at the aerial photography from this fantastic resource called the Strategic Monitoring Programme run through the Plymouth Coastal Observatory, because you can actually see a lot of the structure in there. I mean, John Pitts was having to hack his way through with, a, with his machete, but there's this. And then Dennis said, well, have you looked at the LIDAR? And LIDAR is laser ranging. And it was a, oh my God moment. It's like, isn't that fantastic? We don't even need to go in the field. We can just sit, sit at home drawing squiggly lines. And then to, if you get bored with that, we can take the sea away and look at the bathymetry under the water as well. It's fabulous, fabulous data, open source, free to use, um, and no one had looked at it. So there's that tow heave that I mapped earlier on. And we can take it a further step back. And now we can actually see that the landslide extends possibly as far as 400 meters offshore. So it must date back in time, right into the really complexity of the, of the last ice age and changing sea levels. So that starts to get very difficult, but nobody has known that before. And then the solid geology we can see is folded, which actually does make sense because rocks are folded. That's a syncline, which is like a saucer shaped fold. And this is an anticline, which is like a dome. And you can see they're going in there, but they're also faulted too. And Ramus Galois has done a lot of work on that. So underneath this structure, it's not reason, it's un, not unreasonable to assume that there are more folds that play into the uh, story. The next picture, I'm going to push the photography as far as I can, and then I'm going to step back out again to look at Dowlands in uh, a broader detail. So this is the very head of the Dowlands landslide. And what we can see is that the Cretaceous rocks are riven by what are known as conjugate jointing. When you put a, a rock under strain, it'll tend to crack in parallel joint sets that are often at 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees to each other. You'll see that on the wave cut platforms all around here, but here it is on a, on a huge scale. And stepping back out, that's where we were. There's the conjugate jointing, there's more here. And then when you look at the form of Dowlands, we can see how that arcuate curving structure also follows the jointing to a degree. So interesting stuff. But my friend John King said, what you really need to do is, is um, enhance the slopes, the profile of the slopes. And through uh, the John Grimes partnership, um, 
they did just that using something called a computer algorithm. I, I don't know any you know about these things. It's sort of clever stuff. What it does, it 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 emphasizes the slope, but in exchange, it loses a bit of detail. But that's quite good. Let's zoom in to Goat Island. And what I'm going to mix do is I'm going to mix back to the original lidar. Just have a look at this northwest corner. When you go back to the lidar, you can see what this has done. It's absolutely nailed it. I was wandering around here, looking at the edge of the Goat Island and thinking, how on earth am I going to map that on, um, sorry, on, on, on that? But on this, it's done it for me. And you can now see how this great big block here is actually drifting off to the north. Really useful stuff. But at the same time, it's losing resolution here and here. These are actually really complex islands, like something out of Avatar, but they've been rendered much more simply. And the whole plan of this is to be able to start to map and understand the structure, what's going on. Um, and I tinkered with this for a long time, but you can see these arcuate shears running through and arguably extending right the way through the back of the chasm and the back of Goat Island. And then there are these what appear to be reverse shears coming up the other way. And then a series of long elongate structures actually crossing through Goat Island. And then some more, oh, and, and that back one is a, is a slope. It's a, it's a sloping shear. And then a sort of entirely separate looking shear there and possibly another one there as well. Now, if you're not a geologist or a geomorphologist, you might be in, in need of some help now because it's quite complicated, but the, the patterns tell a simple story. Where there's an arc, that means there's a curving surface like the curving wine glass meeting a flat surface like the landscape. So arcuate curves indicate a, a, a curved shear surface, whereas straight lines indicate a shear that is straight. As you might expect, it doesn't have to be vertical, it could be at an angle, but that's all it is. It's as simple as that. The real trick is how to convert that into cross sections. And the great beauty about the LIDAR is that we can actually, or I can't, but clever people in the Plymouth Observatory can generate cross sections through the LIDAR. So this is reasonably accurate data. There are some issues with it, but it's pretty good. Um, and how do these features interact? How, what, what's going on? Well, I think these arcuate features are arcuate curves coming up towards Goat Island and trying to eat their way into the Goat Island. These are reverse curves. I think they're in the opposite direction running this way, I think. I don't know. These long linear features, well, the back one, we can see it is this back slope. So why not put more in there like that too? And then we have more arcuate Dowlands type shears running through the back of the chasm. And then these final two there. The, the actual raw LIDAR offers something slightly more detailed, I think. We can see these lovely arcuate forms, but we can also see the joint bounded blocks, I think. And so what I've come up with is a very simple way of visualizing what might be going on under the ground. Basically, the shears propagate through the soft fox mold sand. Once they link with the jointing, the natural joints, they break blocks away, which rotate down as a landslide. But when the next shear comes in, what it's going to do is carry all of that complex down into the landslide. And now what we have are both rotational blocks and this feature here, a translational wedge. So this is the one that is just sliding translationally down the shear surface. These ones are rotating. It is quite complicated because the, the, the classification of landslides says that there are translational landslides and rotational. I've been as bold as to suggest that maybe actually it's a little more complicated, but that's for another time. And I think this great big ridge, Cat Ridge, is actually um, that translational block. So let me try and persuade you with that. Let's put that model in there. You see that bit is that bit, that bit is that bit. 
and that bit is that bit. Now, normally I'm used to audience art and pan participation where I hear a mmm, mmm. John, can you give me an mmm? Mmm. Thank you. Oh, I feel relieved. You are still there. <laughs> it's more complicated because actually all of these structures are interwoven with each other. And I, when I came to try and draw that, that became the point where it's too difficult. It already was too difficult to visualize. And these things, these are doing something like that, cutting up in the opposite direction, I think. But what Dennis kept saying, and my good friend John, you need to map it, Richard, you need to map it. Without a map, a full proper map, you're just messing about, which was absolutely right. And in my defense, I deferred doing that because it was so overwhelmingly complicated and I didn't really have access, well, I had access to the software, but not the headspace to, to do it in the appropriate software. So I've done this in <coughs> Photoshop. Um, but, you know, it's a start. And the first thing I noticed, which we already thought was the case, this hedge looks like it's offset to the um, original one. Now, of course, it might be that the hedge was bent. We don't know for sure. But also, the chasm is very much wider on the east side than it is on the west side. And that really does suggest that Goat Island has sort of twisted in a slightly clock clockwise direction as it slipped out. And then what I did, I decided to turn all of those elements into movable objects in <coughs> PowerPoint, because I didn't have any other software, and restore that landscape back to something similar to what the tithe map shows us. You can see there's, there's this cape-like headland. It can't be far off. Um, and even if it is, you know, it's just a, a go at trying to do something. And cracks were observed in the cliff top a few weeks before 1839. I've assumed that they're here. I can't see why, why they shouldn't be anywhere else but here because we know that it was Dowlands that moved first because there's Dowlands Cottage. This is where they reported the movement. Um, whereas a day, it was a day later that Goat Island failed. So Dowlands failed on the evening of Christmas Eve, 1839. And by the end of Christmas day, it had moved enough to take away the support for that Cape-like headland. But that movement was here which meant that Goat Island naturally rotated, it twisted. And we have this other lovely account, a sound like renting cloth. And that would make absolute sense. Imagine standing there, straddling this little crack and watching the ground tearing away in, part in front of you. You probably wouldn't want to because a few hours later, it looked like that as the rest. So can you see the sequential failure? The, the chasm is opening up from the east towards the west. At this point, all of this is going, but the main chasm is still to form up here. It hasn't formed yet. And it's only later on that the, what I call the main chasm block, that big block eventually collapsed. And then finally it moved to the end of the event where we are today. So Mary Buckland's illustration is looking down the chasm there and this increasing complexity that she's got is this complexity down here. And the toe heave view is from there with these impossible pinnacles, which I think these blocks may have moved slightly sideways against each other, listric as they would call it, which would account for these pinnacles perhaps. Very difficult. So we now have a detailed map of the whole complex an idea of how far and in which direction things have moved, uh, the ability to produce profiles anywhere, not me, but the clever people. And so it's time for some modeling. And that warning is, I really do say this, don't try this at home, because I have spent three years doing this. There were times when I had to go and lie down. I was thinking so hard that my head hurt, quite literally. And what follows, I'm not saying it's perfect, I'm saying it's, this is, it might be something like this. And there are undoubtedly errors and um, mistakes in it. There's no question about that. I've got lots of lines, but I'm only going to show you this one, line two, and a very, very brief snippet of line three, because otherwise we'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. But in order to avoid falling into this trap, um, 
we need to know what the underlying structure of the rocks might be, what the original landscape may have been like, and what form the shears may have taken at depth. And actually, with the advent of drones and so on, we can actually see that the, the rocks are folded. Every other model has just assumed a nice gentle dip to the rocks, but they're folded. And you can see that from, a, from the sea in Haven Cliff. Um, there is this enormous dry valley running from Roosden in, and I see Jeff um, Rowland is, is logged on today. This is his work with the LIDAR. Um, that previous picture was there. There's a dry valley running from Roosden right into our complex. And it would have, the front end of Goat Island, I think, is that higher slope of it. So it would have at one time run through here like that. And I think there's evidence of that dissected broken valley on the coast path in Dowlands. And down here, there are river channels. Well, I think they're river channels in the sea cliff. And that explains a lot because a lot of people said, you know, where's all the rock gone? Well, actually, there wasn't a lot there anyway. Um, there was a huge space, a huge dry valley. And that's my attempt to try and sort of illustrate to a degree what it may have been like. It's very difficult. Um, and then where, what are the shears? Well, here are those arcuate Dowlands shears. And then running through Goat Island are these big, long linear shears. Uh, Goat Island's moved towards the sea. The chasm blocks have slid down into the chasm as Goat Island's moved out. But this, this land surface here was once up there. If you hadn't seen that there, this, this line here was once there because all of this has moved this way back into the chasm as Goat Island moved out. It collapsed in and there. So there are also deep shears running back at a steep angle back in towards the chasm. Um, so at least three different shear groups and the original jointing. No wonder it's complicated. So we're coming towards the end. Line two, uh, it runs through the back scar of the cliff over this great big, what I call the main chasm block. There's a big rift between it and Goat Island, and then there's Goat Island there. And I'm going to change presentations now to this one. So again, just to cover that story, there's it goes through the chasm over Goat Island, includes the landslide on, on the front of Goat Island, which is much older, I think, and just clips these, what I've marked as yellow, odd reverse, counter-reverse shears. And what I've done is looked at where we can see the geology. We can see where the chalk is from there. So we can see where the un where we can project where the unconformity might be in the back scar. We can do the same on the front of Goat Island because we can see the rock. We can't actually see the back the chalk in the back scar and the bottom of it may well have been carved out. But on the foreshore, we can again, we can see the Jurassic. So the unconformity has to be somewhere down there. And then there's so much of this landscape that survived, I've tried to put it back using that mapping. It says to me that Goat Island's moved about 36 meters. Put it all back and now we've got another point where we can actually draw the unconformity. So I'm suggesting that the, the rocks are dipping, they're folded like that. An anticline near the cliff, a syncline under the foreshore. And then the next thing I did was to Put the chasm block back up, draw a back scar to it, which reflects something like the cliff, and then put it back down where it is now so we can get an idea of what sort of angle the back scar may have taken. And after that, it is, oh, and I just do the same thing with the, um, the other blocks. And then it's just like a monkey with a typewriter trying to find the shapes and forms that allow me to move those blocks. To where they are today. And believe you me, that is not easy. I'm going to skip all this because we're a bit short of time. There's detail in there. Um, so what I've done is animate the event. This is my reconstruction going right back hundreds of thousands of years. There's a dry valley, dry valley fill. Um, I then dissected that to form the old landslide in front of Goat Island. So this is, you know, the, the weeks leading up to 1839. Then 1839, Christmas Eve, Dowlands moves and absolutely nothing happens here because Dowlands is away in the distance. It's on the other side of this 
It's about 200 meters away. It's moving, it's taking away the support for Goat Island. And then eventually, 24 hours later, it starts to move. And we start to see cracks and fissures break opening up. The front of Goat Island is sliding seaward. The back has a much more difficult route because the shear surface is in, is angle is increasing. The, um, the actual chasm block is breaking away now, a little bit later, and off we go. You can see how the material's fallen into the um, rift form because the chasm block is rotating backwards while Goat Island is only rotating a little bit on its backside like that. And uh, the point of rotation, that's something I'm not going to talk about today because it's will be here for ages, but that is trying to explain those reverse shears. And eventually we arrive at the 1839 condition. Um, there, on that line there like that. Then if we add some erosion to the modern day, that's where we are today. And when you stand looking at the beach, looking back along this line here, you actually see this dissected dry river valley, I think. So just to finish with, a little grand tour of Goat Island. As you walk up the back of Goat Island, you're walking up the back scar where everything slipped into the big rift or ravine behind you. Um, there's a rotated block, which is, which is rotated slightly backwards. There's this really complex zone. And then there's a translational block that's just slipped seaward. So there it is. Everything here has slipped back into the, into the rift behind us there, like that. This is standing on the complex zone. So here, everything has actually slumped backwards into towards Goat Island, towards the chasm, but only by a very a relatively small amount. And then sitting on the front, you're actually on the translational block, which is the least disturbed because it's all it's done is slipped nicely, gently seaward. And if you had been standing there two or 3,000 years ago, or 100,000 years ago, you'd have been looking down into a great big dry valley, a bit like Whitlands or um, the other dry valleys around here. And the reason the landslide was so enormous was because Goat Island sat on this southern facing sloping limb of the structure. And the reason it stopped where it did was because the dips became shallower up here. And so friction overcame um, the unloading. And I think the result of that is that we're not going to see very much for thousands of years. In the future, if we might see a little bit of recession happening up here, but what I would expect to see are, are these arcuate shears eating their way into Goat Island. But I think that's thousands of years away. I think the movement was so enormous that um, we're not going to see anything for a long time which is famous last words, means tomorrow there'll be headline news, massive landslide in Go Island. But I don't think so. That is line three. I'm not going to say very much about it other than it's about accommodating this really complex pre-existing Dowland landslide. It moved, unloaded Go Island, Go Island shunted forward and it pushed these blocks into, into new blocks and heaved up the tow heave. Um, I have got lots of, you know, lots of detail about that, but I'm not going to do it. Um, so just to finish with, the trouble is that to really nail this thing, it needs to be mapped and modelled in 3D. And I don't have the skills to do that. I've said that. It's too difficult for me. We need somebody who's clever and young and keen. Because I'm sure you actually get a lot more out of that illustration than the, the plainer ones. So just to finish with, yeah. I have offered this paper to the um, Proceedings of the Geologists Association and they have accepted it with major revisions. They don't like the Mickey Mouse modeling. I said it was Mickey Mouse. They don't like the Mickey Mouse mapping. They're worried about the repeatability of it. And they're particularly concerned that the language is a little bit too informal and I should really codify it for them, but I'm not gonna do that. So that's the end um, and the list of some of the people, not everyone, but some of the people that I uh, really ha relied on to make this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was really entertaining and uh, wonderful. I, if this, we're going to open this up for questions now. So ladies and gents, if, um, if you'd like to ask Richard a question, if you could just pop, um, uh, pop something into the chat box, doesn't matter what it is, 
as long as you want, you know, uh, just say me. Um, and then what we can do is um, we can then sort of unmute you and you can, you can ask the questions away. While we're waiting for a, a question, I, Richard, I'm in Timber Hill. Um, so are we, are we in danger up here? Um, um, there's <laughs> you know, been a lot of money has been spent on Lyme Regis. <laughs> uh, but Timber Hill is the old hill up behind the spittles is the cliff line yeah. from 125,000 years ago. There's no other way of saying it, John. <laughs> Thank you for, um, yes, thank you for that. Anyway, I, I live in Upline on a huge inland landslide yeah. uh, next to the viaduct, if it helps. <laughs> um, okay, anyone got a question for Richard? All you have to do is just pop something in the, the chat box. Um, lots of thanks here, Richard. Uh, yeah, I see that. So that's, that's wonderful. Sharon, Sharon is holding a hand up. Oh, well done, Sharon. We found it difficult to find that feature. Bear with me. I will just get to you and unmute you. Okay, Sharon, you should have the ability to unmute yourself now. So if you'd like to do that and then ask Richard a question. Still showing us muted. Was that say a, a false hand up then maybe? So sure. whilst, whilst we're waiting, any more questions, please? What should you, you're so thorough, Richard. Well, maybe people are shocked. I mean, there, there is an awful lot in there. Um, all I would say is if anyone is looking to do a bit of research, if anyone has a bit of time on their hands and knows about GPS, GIS, GPS modeling, computer modeling and wants to do a bit of work, um, I'm well up for a bit of collaboration because I'm stuck. I can't go any further uh, because I am not going to go through the head headache of trying to learn some of this. Well, I've tried learning some of this 3D software and yeah, not, not for me. So co-author on a paper on one of the most famous landslides in the world, open to anyone who can, who's up for it. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, just one more chance then to, if anyone wants to ask Richard a question. Um, oh yes, Max. Oh, uh, there's trouble, yeah. <laughs> just in okay, we, uh, we know Max, so we can talk to him. Okay. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have um, questions for Richard, you can, you can get hold of him via the, the, the website um, uh, www.fossilfestival.co.uk. There is a contact us section at the bottom. If you you know think of a question a bit later on, please feel free to email them in and I'll pass them over to Richard. But um, just like to say, Richard, thank you very, very much for today. Uh, you, you've worked very hard. You've been on other calls as well. So thank you for that. And um, I, hope you've, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks ever so much. That's it for today for, for the, the talks um, on the Virtual Fossil Festival. Join us again tomorrow at um, 11 o'clock. We'll be hooking up with the guys at the Yorkshire Fossil Festival where they'll be chalking with dinosaurs. So thank you ever so much and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye, everybody.